Hey guys, in this guide we will go over the military and other ways to defend your fortress. Like always, you can find separate chapters down in the description. Now let's get started. There are a lot of different things that can harm your fort. We will cover a lot of them in this video, but without making it 3 hours long, we won't be covering every situation. First off, you need to keep an eye out for yourself. You will make a lot of silly mistakes when playing, so it's good to take note of a couple of tips. First off, never forget to pause the game. Dwarf Fortress moves pretty quickly and a lot of important events can happen in a couple of seconds. You can miss a strange mood or the ghost messing stuff up to later find your carpenter is going nuts in the tavern. So make sure you are paused when designing the perfect bedroom layout for your dwarves or when alt tabbing to check on the wiki. The next dangers are water and lava. Both of these can be a great addition to your fort if you can manage to prevent it from flowing where it shouldn't. Death by water can either happen by having too much of it or having too little of it. Having too much of it will of course cause drowning, but how much water is too much water for a dwarf? There are 7 levels of depth water can have on a single layer. 1 to 3 are perfectly safe for your dwarves, but are harmful for aquatic animals since they will start suffocating. A depth of 1 water will lay down a mud layer if it makes contact with a stone floor. This can be used to create farms on the ground if there are no suitable soil layers. A depth of 2 will cause dwarves to stop work orders. This can sometimes happen when dealing with aquifers, so be mindful of that. If a body of water consists mostly of depth 2 water tiles in a small pool of water, and there is at least one tile that has a depth of 1, this will eventually evaporate. So don't rely on any water sources that have this. The effect of evaporating water is obviously increased in warm and very warm biomes. A depth of 3 will mean dwarves are waist deep in water, so still safe. This is also the last depth they will freely walk through. From a depth of 4, your dwarves will be starting to get swimming experience, which is very useful since this will prevent drowning. It is hard to do this consistently, but it can be done with a swimming pool. A depth of 6 is still safe for your dwarves, as long as they are conscious, but in a depth of 7, any non-swimmer dwarf will drown, and since it's pretty rare for your dwarves to even have one level of swimming, this can be pretty deadly. Any dwarf will start drowning in 7x7 seven seven water if there is more water on the levels above them, or if there is a lowered bridge above the layer of water. You can turn on the depth numbers in the top right corner of the screen. Now to take a look at magma. There are two big differences between water and magma. The first one is that your dwarves won't get a chance to drown since they will be boiling and melting away, often exploding before getting a chance. The other part is that magma has a different way it handles pressure. Pressure mechanics in Dwarf Fortress need their own separate video, but just so you can make use of some magma, here is a golden rule. As long as it doesn't fall, or you don't use bumps to move it in Z layers, it won't be pushed by any other pressure. This way you can dig out a straight tunnel from a resource and use it to power your forges. Magma won't necessarily insta-kill dwarves. It will set them on fire first and then slowly kill them if they didn't fall in. This is why it's a smart idea to channel out one tile in the tunnel and use this to dump water. This way the fire will be put out automatically when they cross the channel tile. The water will afterwards turn into obsidian if the magma flows over it. So we know now that water and magma can be pretty dangerous, but we can also use this to our advantage. We can for example build a moat from it to block easy access to our fort, combining this with levers and bridges to secure certain points. Or we use it as a dead trap where we store hot magma behind a bridge till some poor goblins walk over a pressure plate to release it. I would recommend making your moat 2 layers deep and 4 layers wide. This way we can prevent swimming creatures to climb the walls of the moat and prevent jumping creatures to cross it. Now let's say there were some flying creatures that were able to cross it. There are ways we can still block them from entering our fortress. This can be done with constructions like walls and bridges. Walls and bridges once built will count as terrain and for the most part be indestructible. This is important since there are creatures that are able to destroy buildings, but since they can't destroy these walls and bridges, we can say we are pretty safe behind them. This may not be the most fun way of defending your fortress, but it is definitely the most effective way. I like to create multiple points where I can cut off the pads of the invaders so that I can slowly pick them off the further they come in. 
Now this wouldn't be Dwarf Fortress if we didn't create a hammer squad to defend our gates against evil. To get started with a military, I would recommend to have at least 20 dwarves since there are probably still plenty of jobs to be done around the fortress and you don't want them to delay that much. There are two different routes you can take when creating a military. You either make them ranged or melee. Both of them having their disadvantages and advantages. The choice is totally up to you. Some people prefer a lot of melee dwarves, others like to have a firing squad of dwarves standing on the wall. I will be covering the melee squads in this video since they are a lot easier to get going than range squads at the moment. To get started we first have to create a squad. This can be done by pressing Q in the squad menu. To enable this menu you first have to assign a militia commander in the noble screen. Your militia commander will also be your first squad leader so preferably you want to have some leadership skills since they will often be leading demonstrations during training. This doesn't matter too much, but can be useful if he already has a ton of skills related to combat. Since this will probably be your first squad in the fortress, you won't have a lot to choose from when we look at the selection of recruits. Any dodging, fighting or wrestling experience they have is very useful to begin with. So now that we have a squad, we want to tell them what to wear. We can do this immediately after creating our squad, or by going to the squad menu, selecting our squad and going to the equipment menu in the bottom. We have some basic uniforms the game start us with, but for now let's create our own simple uniform since we won't be having enough equipment for our dwarves yet. If you don't have enough weapons laying around of the same type, try to assign specific weapons to a dwarf. This way they use the same weapon over and over again instead of picking up the nearest pointy thing to stab things with. Specializing is a lot more beneficial than spreading out over multiple weapon skills. There is not really a limit here, but they will eventually become good with multiple types of weapons. It will just take a very very long time to do so. We can assign a specific weapon to dwarves in the equipment screen by going to their details. Here we can add a new weapon and select a specific weapon. This will show you a list with all the available weapons in your fortress to choose from. If you are a bit further along and have forged some weapons, we can create a specific uniform for that weapon. This way they gain focus experience with one type of weapon which will be more useful than having a little experience in a lot of different weapons without having to manage each dwarf's equipment manually. We can do this in the equipment screen by adding a new uniform or by saving a uniform of a specific dwarf. When adding a new uniform I like to have them use a specific weapon type but to let them choose freely what armor to use. Let's for example create a warhammer squad. So for the body, head, legs, hands and feet, we want to just select the first generic option. This way they will just wear the first thing they find when looking for armor. If you know you have enough breastplates or male shirts laying around, you can specify one of these so they at least wear metal armor. For the weapon we want to specify a specific weapon type. Since we are creating a Warhammer squad, we will select Warhammers of course. If you know you have the resources available, you can even select what type of material your warhammer should be made out of. Since the material a weapon is made out of will decide a lot of variables on how potent it can be. For the warhammers we would want something heavy like silver or platinum since this will increase the damage we are able to do when smashing into stuff. We can specify this by clicking on mats and selecting the specific material we want the weapon to be made of. In our case we will take silver. Now they will only wear silver warhammers. You don't necessarily have to do this, but it can be a bit of fun for roleplaying and min-maxing. So now that we have a way of telling them what to wear, we need to create a training schedule and give them a place to train. To assign a schedule, we go to the squad menu and go to the schedule at the bottom of the screen. This screen can be a bit haunting at the beginning, but let's just choose the constant training option. Some people will argue that staggered training is better since they will also help out the fortress every other month, which is true. But I prefer to let them focus on defending my gates instead of crafting beds. I will make a more in-depth video about the military going over specific training schedules and weapon types. So now that they know what to wear and what to do, we need to create a place for them to actually do it. To start out, we can have a simple room with a couple of beds in it to create a barracks from the zone menu. Here they will sleep, train and store their weapons and ammo if you provide storage in the form of cabinets and chests. 
This doesn't really have to be a big room, but the important thing is where you place it. Since this is where most of your military will be living, apart from eating, it is a good idea to put it at the entrance of your fort. Either at the ground level for any sieges, or near your cavern layers for the fun stuff from down below. Once you have created a zone, we need to assign our squad to it. We can do this by selecting our barracks and pressing on the flag icon. Here we will see a list of squads we have created and what they are assigned to do in the barracks. We can assign multiple squads to our barracks, but more on this in the military video. For now, let's just assign our Warhammer squad to the barracks for sleeping, training, storing equipment and storing ammo. Once we are done with this and unpause the game, your dwarves should rush to get their uniform equipped and go to the barracks to start training. Now we got them training, but how do we use them to defend our fortress? To do this, we can select our squad and assign them an order from the bottom of the squad menu. For now, let's just cover the most important one, the assign kill order. Once you have selected this order, we can target any number of creatures for our squad to go kill. Once you have selected the targets, don't forget to confirm the selection. Another fun way of defending our fortress is by using traps. These can be very useful to harm, sometimes kill, or even trap enemies. To start with making traps, you first need a couple of materials. For most traps you will need a mechanism from the mechanic shop, and some other form of item depending on what trap you want to build. For the most basic trap, a stonefall trap, we just need a mechanism and a stone, which are pretty easy to come by when starting out. These won't kill anything bigger than a rat, but will break a bone or two to at least slow any enemies down. Fun fact is that a heavier stone will increase the damage done, but is very tedious to micromanage this. The next type of trap, which is a bit harder to make, is a weapon strap. This requires a mechanism and up to 10 weapons. Apart from the normal weapons your dwarves can use, you can also use non-dwarven weapons from other civilizations, or use any of the trap specific weapons from the forge, carpenter or the glass furnace. These can do a lot of damage to enemies, including blasting them into bits. Another benefit, apart from the free red paint for your walls, is that weapon traps can reset themselves after a random unknown time. This does not always happen though, since a victim can also get stuck in the weapon trap, jamming it, and requiring a dwarf to come and clean it up. Then we have gauge traps, which lack the fun of injuring our enemies, but are as useful as any trap to neutralize the enemy. These require a mechanism and a cage to be built. Once built, any enemy walking over it will have a chance to be captured. Not all creatures can be captured though, at least not with a simple cage trap. Some of them can just walk over them like titans, and others can escape cage traps after being captured like thieves. After capturing a creature, it may be useful to know you can build cages and link them to a lever, allowing you to safely release whatever is in your cage behind a wall or two. If dwarves fall unconscious or asleep on a cage trap, it will also trigger capturing your own dwarf. As last trap, we have the spike spear traps, which is a bit weird to use. Constructing them without linking a mechanism to them will just build upright spikes. Not being able to damage anything that passes over them, but do impale any targets that fall on them. They also don't discriminate between friends and foes. So, the other way to use them is by linking them to a mechanism which will cause them to retract into the floor, ready to be triggered and impale foes standing on the same tile. The best way to utilize the first traps we covered is to create, as I like to call it, a hull, fun and pleasure. For normal people, this would be a normal trap hall. There are different strategies depending on who you ask, but I like to make a chessboard pattern with different kinds of traps, but this is all up to you. Another way that you could encounter some danger is if you don't take care of your dead. If you don't take care of your dead dwarves, they will come and hunt you. These dwarves will turn into ghosts that can mess with a lot of stuff. They can destroy workshops, trigger levers, and even possess other dwarves. To deal with this, you will need a greystone or a slab to commemorate their death. Once built and assigned to the right dwarf, their ghost will be put to rest. So what kind of enemies can you expect in Dwarf Fortress? To start off with, we have the other civilizations roaming around the map, elves, goblins and humans. 
you are able to start a war with them if your Unsiv hasn't started this already by sieging one of their cities. Goblins are a bit different since they are hostile to watch you most of the time anyway. Elves can also be pissed at you if you shop too many trees and kill too much natural wildlife, causing them to become hostile to watch you. But who cares, they are elves. Apart from being sieged by other civs, there are smaller groups that are also able to attack you. Mainly the undead and the necromancers leading them. If your fort is close to a necromancer tower or unpleasant by him, there is a chance you will get a pop-up that the undead are roaming the lands. These can be a bit tougher than your normal sieges since they aren't affected by things like exhaustion or lack of breeding. The most effective way to deal with undead is by bashing in their head. A lot of dangers can also come from within your fortress. Vampires and weirbees often sneak into your fortress either through visiting your taverns or by traveling along with a migrant wave. Oftentimes they are just normal dwarves living a normal life, apart from the fact that they either leech blood from sleeping dwarves or transform with a full moon. Vampires can be dealt with by the justice system, if enough witnesses survive to accuse the vampire that is. Werebees are a bit tougher since it would mean separating newcomers from your current population and waiting on a full moon. This can be done by making use of a burrow and assigning all your new dwarves to it. Provide some drinks and some food for them and close them off from the fortress. Now it will be a waiting game for the first full moon to hit. This will happen every month between the 14th and the 17th of that month. This of course carries the risk of infecting other dwarves if they are bitten by any beasts. It won't just be the beasts attacking everyone on sight once they've gone crazy. Normal dwarves can be just as violent when they're struck in a strange mood. Having a strange mood isn't a bad thing, as long as you can provide the right materials for the dwarf in question. In case you use the lost gems in the throne for your mayor, you can always leave one tile space around the workshop. This can be used to build a wall around the workshop to contain the dwarf with a strange mood without harming any other dwarves. The dwarf stuck in the workshop will die of hydration or hunger, unless it's a vampire, in which case you will have a box of fun to open whenever you feel the need to. And if all of this wasn't enough already, you will also be ambushed by thieves and snatchers. These try to steal items or children from your fortress and can be pretty easily dealt with if you have some dogs. Place dogs at the entrance of your fort, so that if any thieves come, you are warned about them, since they are discovered by the dogs. The easiest way to do this is by creating a pasture and assigning the dogs to it. With that we covered a lot of fun stuff that can happen to a starting fort, providing some ways to deal with them along the way. The important part is that you can decide for yourself how hard you want to make the game. But it doesn't matter if you just lock yourself in and try to make an optimized fort or let Armark himself decide what fate awaits your fort. The most important part is that you're having fun. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more Dwarf Fortress content. We've already passed a thousand subscribers within two weeks so I want to keep these good vibes going. Thanks for all the comments and the feedback. I reach each and every one of them and it's been great. So thanks again.